thanks for the invitation. So we're studying climate informatics um, due to the threat of climate change and the extreme events such as uh, extreme storms and heat waves, which can cause wildfire and drought, um, and their effects on communities and ecosystems. And this is based on a vision that machine learning can shed light on climate change. So there's certainly a scientific consensus on climate change. There's some things that are known. Um, but there are a variety of open questions, such as um, how, how does climate change affect extreme events? Let's look at what is known. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, this panel that advises the UN, puts out reports in their 2013 report. They looked at observed data, and this is just looking at um, surface level uh, surface temperature trends from 1900, and there has been a warming. So what this means is, on average, temperature is increasing, okay? So let's have a very simplistic view. This is also a plot put out by the IPCC in their summary for policymakers. Um, if we considered that we had a PDF, a probability distribution for temperature, um, and we had warming of the mean, we just get a mean shift to the right from a, a normal PDF, a Gaussian in gray, to the dotted line. Um, if that's all that's happening, then we're going to get heavier tails on the hot end, so higher probability of extreme hot weather. Um, but you'll see that there would be then lower probability of extreme cold weather. And since there's been a mean shift, we've observed warming, we might be getting some of these effects. And, and this effect alone, the mean shift, might explain some of what we're observing. Um, but of course, this is just a small part of the story. Um, even of course, take a, a normal PDF without a mean shift, just by increasing the variance, we can end up with heavier tails on both ends, um, which means not only would we have a higher probability of extreme hot, um, we'd also have a higher probability of extreme cold events. This may be happening. There's a lot of uncertainty around the variance. Um, and generally speaking, there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen in these tails, because that was a very sort of idealized setting that everything was symmetric. Right, there's an infinite number of scenarios. Um, certainly, we could be in a case um, where we get about constant probability of extreme cold events, um, but extreme hot events are increasing. And I bring up this, um, this problem. So understanding extremes has been put forward as one of the grand challenges by climate scientists. Um, and so let's take this as an example of how we would apply machine learning. And so say we were going to study extremes. Um, but by definition, the extreme events are, are rare. Um, so we're not going to have many, many sort of positive examples of them in historical data. Um, and then we talked about, simply for temperature alone, ways that climate change might be um, changing its distribution. Um, so the, the trouble is now that statistics we can get from historical data may not be sufficient alone for future prediction. Um, so what's really unique about this as an application for machine learning is that um, scientists for over 40 years have been trying to simulate the climate. So these physics-based simulations can then output simulated data. Um, I'll get into these in a moment, but essentially we're evolving millions of variables over, over the surface of the globe, over time. And so now we're in a massive data setting, and that's where machine learning comes in. Um, and so I want to argue that this is um, an interesting and sort of unique application area for machine learning. Um, and we'll get to the climate models in a second. But we do have some past historical data, but it's mostly very limited. So you may have had a sea captain writing down temperature in a fountain pen, and then it rained or the ship sank. We didn't have a global grid of measurement stations. Instead, we have um, proxies. So they're biological records, like you can look um, at tree rings to um, infer nutrient properties and temperature properties. Similarly, with corals in the ocean, you can take a core of, of Earth under a lake. And it's known that different pollen species thrive under different nutrient and temperature conditions. Um, you can take a core in a glacier, a long cylinder 
of ice, which will have trapped air bubbles um, showing you atmospheric gas concentrations such as CO2, which we care about for, um, for understanding the atmosphere. And you can also look at water isotopes to infer temperature. So this is actually not a big data problem. It's mostly very heterogeneous collections of small data in the past. Um, we are now, in, the, in um, only a few hundred years, um, doing global measurements. We're also taking massive amounts of satellite imagery. Um, we are in the very sort of heavy measurement era, but it doesn't go back too far in time. Um, but the climate model simulations, the outputs from these physics-driven uh, models, give us a lens into the distant past and the distant future. Um, and there are some caveats that I'll get to uh, shortly, but I think that this is sort of a unique area. And we do have some critical mass in this area. Um, so climate informatics um, now refers to a community. We had our first international workshop in 2011. Um, we've actually had a lot of people you know, from France, Germany, uh, Asia, the Middle East. We've had um, a lot of international reach. Um, and I wanted to quickly plug the workshop um, in Boulder with a submission deadline of Monday for two to four page abstracts. And we have a lot of funding uh, for, we usually try to bring students and early career scientists. But if you can't make it to that, oh sorry, the deadline's the 30th, so I guess that's Sunday. Um, I would also mention that if this interests you, um, on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday um, at Je Sieu, we're having um, a practice hackathon for our climate informatics hackathon. And if you're interested, um, you're certainly welcome to participate. And later I'll show the link, the starting kit is already online. Um, okay, so when I was sort of pitching this problem more to a machine learning community, um, so, so I just wanted to mention, the National Center for Atmospheric Research is this big center really focused on, um, on understanding the atmosphere, and so it's a great place to meet climate scientists. You're a data scientist, or your student is a data scientist, if you, if you can come to this. Um, first, it's beautiful that time of year, but also it's a good place to meet a, a climate scientist. And when we try to explain to machine learners where um, we could make a dent, um, Vinay mentioned that um, we're, we're sort of not as far along as bioinformatics, but it's like the early days of bioinformatics, right? A anything is possible. And we can try to break up the, the world of, of climate informatics into potential problems, but there might be um, other problems as well. So I mentioned that the paleo proxy data that we have, that's important um, to try to reconstruct past climates because we didn't have good measurements back then um, and to put current climates in context. Um, uh, governments now, such as the UK government, is asking for climate predictions at the level of postal codes. And that's much um, more fine-grained than the predictions that we're getting, say, from the physics-based models. So there's a whole field on downscaling. I'll also mention that our sort of two-hour version of this tutorial is online on both my and Arindam Banerjee's website if you want to watch the video or look at the slides on some of these other topics. Um, I'm, my group has mostly focused on um, using ensembles of these physics-driven climate model predictors and, try to, and trying to improve, um, reduce uncertainty on ensemble predictions. Um, I'm specifically interested in spatiotemporal data. I'm glad John introduced non-stationarity in the beginning. I'm, introduced, I'm interested, in, interested and gonna talk today about how do you learn when um, you have non-stationarity not only if, in time but also in space. Um, and I'm motivated with extremes. I hope to talk about some hot off the press extremes results we have um, if I have time at the very end. Okay, and the goal of this talk, it's basically a, a variable length talk. So um, I'm gonna adaptively decide how much to do and that's why I'm gonna give you the take home messages at the beginning. One take home message is that, you know, you should work on climate informatics. It's compelling uh, for machine learning. Um, Algorithmically, as I said, I'm going to focus on non-stationarity um, over both time and space. But along the way, and sort of relevant to the workshop, I just want to demonstrate that starting with an application, you can still uh, come across problems that really um, ask new algorithmic questions in the field of machine learning. And so sort of the punchlines there that I'm going to talk about are Online learning, when you also have um, distributed 
or uh, spatial or other dimensions at play and may also have non-stationarity in that direction that's in those directions that's largely open. Um, what if you need to make predictions at multiple time scales simultaneously? So there are specific applications that beg this question in climate. Um, you can also look at the same sort of thing in, in a financial um, stability and monitoring setting, and there may be um, Criteo relevant problems there. And also tracking highly deformable patterns, so not just object tracking that you have in computer vision. Now if we're looking at e extreme storms, hurricanes, and those sorts of patterns in fluids. Okay. Um, so again, um, just quickly on the, on the level of, of punchlines, can we actually learn the level of non-stationarity from our data? Um, can we use a multitask approach to predict at multiple time frames simultaneously and perform better than treating each task independently? Um, and various approaches that exploit local structure where you, you, you might want to be local in space, you may also want to exploit a temporal structure. Okay. So I do have to mention um, these climate models in slightly more detail. Um, so all you really need to know about them is they're trying to simulate these four major systems, atmosphere, ocean, land, and cryosphere, which is processes involving ice. Um, but each of those systems itself has physical components, um, which themselves are each a mathematical model. So each of these things, such as, you know, advection of heat from land or um, precipitation, um, various processes of atmospheric gases um, changing in the atmosphere. Each one is a differential equation, so a non-stochastic partial dif differential equation. The, the parameters are thought to essentially be known based on first principles, but there's still a lot of differences in how different modeling groups do the simulations. So first off, we can't resolve at scale, so we're doing some kind of discretization um, different modeling teams do this differently. Um, so the size of the grid box might be around 100 kilometers per side. Um, for some, the vertical, instead of being height, could be based on a level set of pressure. But this is actually a really hard problem. You have massive differences in scale if you look at the coupling of the atmosphere and the ocean. And think of time scale. So the atmosphere circles, uh, circulates on the order of a couple of weeks. The ocean circulates on the order of hundreds of years. And so where they meet, you have to resolve differences in time scale, um, similarly for spatial scale. So why do I bring up these differences in the models? Um, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is um, informed by a lot of different models. This is, these are some of them, and there's supposed to be a lot of text here. So um, each model, so the first one was from Princeton in 1969, so each model is a 34, 30 or 40 years old laboratory of people um, implementing these first scientific principles and modeling assumptions and discretizations, typically using Fortran, so that there are these really large um, software systems that then um, you, can, you can run them. Right, you can set a bunch of initial conditions, let all the processes interact, and then measure certain things in the future, measure temperature, humidity at certain locations, et cetera. And then you'll get these trajectories for any individual variable. So this is a measure of temperature called um, anomaly. I'll, I'll ex explain that shortly, but it's a measure of temperature that in this case is averaged um, both globally and annually. And the models from all these different countries are kind of predicting all over the place. Their mean is in red, and the observed value um, in the past is in blue. And you'll see that um, we, we have a lot of uncertainty into the future. And even though it would have been OK to maybe predict with the mean here, the multimodal mean, we start to have divergence, and the mean d d diverges from most of the models. Um, so there's this question of how to combine um, combine the predictions. Um, an anomaly just means that you take at each location, you take from the time series, um, you subtract out the constant, which is the average um, of that time series at that location, um, so that when you average now these time series globally, you reduce uh, the variance as opposed to looking at raw temperatures or uh, the raw value. So here's the machine learning problem. Um, no one model predicts all the time. The red curve is the average prediction that was basically found to 
be better than using any one fixed model from one of the countries. And they've done this massive project of actually saving the outputs of these physics-driven simulations, which now we view as input data. This is on a very grand scale. So all the model simulation um, outputs that have been stored dwarf all the satellite measurements that, have, uh, that are stored. And a lot of it hasn't been analyzed. Um, and they're starting to be Bayesian approaches, et cetera. Um, sometimes they make relatively strong assumptions, like the mean is good, or there exists a good model in the ensemble, et cetera. Um, so there was actually this interest in ensembles uh, coming from the climate community. Um, and I had been working on ensembles um, in machine learning. So let's, let's, let's view this as a challenge for machine learning. So we want to improve the predictions of the ensemble. We want to predict. Uh, the future value of the blue curve, right? So um, in this example, the future value of temperature. But it's not just a time series prediction problem, because instead of just having access to this curve, we have access to the simulated um, the, the, the predictions from all the different models. OK, and, and this has been one of the main thrusts of my work, and probably what I'll spend most of the time on, certainly not going over all of these, but looking specifically now um, at online learning, let's first just consider um, time varying data. So the, the spatial effects are remove, removed because we've averaged over the whole globe. Um, and so we'll, have, we'll show an approach for learning from data that varies over time, so learning in the non-stationary setting. Um, and where we're going is that we actually have spatiotemporal data um, that varies over um, both time and space. Um, and so that's where we're going. So the red curve, the multi-model mean, is saying, OK, we have some ensemble of models. I've, I've put five here. There's now like 35 models from all the different countries. And we're going to have, we're going to bet our money equally. Essentially, it's just a, a discrete uniform distribution over the models. That's what the red curve is doing. And if you take sort of a, a data assimilation approach or allow the observation to be observed at the end of each prediction interval, then of course you can do an adaptive weighted average. So you could update, um, so in January all the models predict um, temperature for January and at the end of the month we've observed the temperature, we can maybe take the squared loss between predicted and observed, we're just, um, you know, any loss that makes sense for a scalar and then update our weights accordingly. Okay, so you can do this. Any algorithm that's going to do this, though, um, remember, climate is changing. The, you know, the the sequence of losses may be non-station, may be non-stationary. Um, so, if model B had accrued weight by having, um, oh, and by the way, the weights are renormalized. So, if model B had the lowest loss in the first um, several rounds, um, because that had the best predictions, but then conditions change a little bit and model A is better, whether you're predicting with the mode of the distribution or a weighted average, um, it's going to take a while for model A's prediction um, to contribute much um, because it has such a low weight. Okay, so in AI, um, in, in, in terms of AI, this is an instance of explore versus exploit. So, um, the trade-off is exploiting by um, predicting with the current best predicting climate model. Um, and explore would be always being nimble, hedging your bets a little bit more, and being ready to switch to another model should conditions change. Um, and this instance of explore exploit um, hinges on how often the best model, um, the best climate model changes. Um, so, uh, so in, in, my, in my history, um, I started by studying um, non-stationary data and designing algorithms that had theory behind them. Um, and later, we sort of resurrected that algorithm when I started working on, on climate applications. But what we're really interested in getting to is the spatiotemporal approach. So let's just first look at the temporal approach. So I said the trade-off hinges on how often the identity of the best model switches. So that's essentially the non-stationarity of your observations. And we had previously, a long time ago, worked on an algorithm to learn that level of non-stationarity. Um, 
so this, this whole online learning literature was kind of introduced um, with John by talking about bandits. Um, this is a, a full information setting. Um, and let me zoom in on what these algorithms are. Each algorithm is updating weights over the climate models, which are your experts, whatever, stocks, et cetera, but in this case, climate model predictions. Um, and they, the algorithms just differ on their setting of the switching rate parameter. Um, so this is not a Bayesian algorithm, but it can be derived by writing down an appropriately um, defined graphical model. So uh, nodes are random variables and edges are conditional probability dependencies or distributions. There's a, there's a Markov chain here, a hidden Markov chain, among which climate model or which expert is the best. Um, and so you have now a state space of, if there's 35 models, 35 states. Um, and then observations are you know, the temperature. This is more generalized, if you've seen an HMM, this is more generalized because we're allowing arbitrary dependencies between the observations. But to get a whole family of online learning algorithms called mul multiplicative weights algorithms, um, they, they just fall out as Bayesian updates of this graphical model defined as follows. So whatever your loss is, loss is just your squared difference between predicted and observed if you're doing this uh, climate uh, application, just view that as the negative log likelihood of the um, observation, so as the admissions probability given the value of, the, of which expert is best and allow dependence on, on past observations. You get this as your Bayesian update. I haven't talked about the transition dynamics, okay? Um, but this gives you a family of online learning algorithms. One of the ones you've probably heard of most is Hedge. So Hedge says, for the transition dynamics, I'm just going to assume there's one best expert. The transition dynamics in a Markov chain, right, is a stochastic matrix, which is the number of states by the number of states. And each row is going to say, if I'm in a particular uh, state at the current time, give me a probability distribution over next state. Um, so to get Hedge, you just use the identity matrix for um, your transition matrix. So you're saying with probability one, I will be in the same state at the next time. And so the probability of transition to any other state is zero. So that's how we would simplify um, this update. And this update, as you can see, is going to drive the weights um, of the experts with high loss down to zero exponentially fast. So if you start with uniform weights, you'll quickly hone in and get a very um, low entropy distribution. Not great if you have non-stationary data, okay? So um, a nice thing, and actually this also relates to one of John's slides as well, a nice thing that had been done in the literature is saying, well, instead of saying that um, if, if you know, the UK model is best in January, then I assume the UK model will be best in February. You could say if the UK model is best in January, then with high probability, it's best in February. And high probability is quantified by some parameter. This is exploit. This is how much we're exploiting the current best model. Let's mix in a little bit of the explore. Let's say, well, let's just share some probability with all the other experts. If there's n experts, we'll just divide up the remaining mass with all n minus one of them. Okay, um, and so the idea here though is that alpha now is, is gonna be the switching rate between um, best experts, but you can't know that beforehand. So might as well use a hedge or static update to learn that parameter from a set of meta experts, so a deep architecture where each, um, each expert is using, each meta expert is, is an algorithm that's using a different value of the switching rate parameter. Um, so this was just something I had happened to work on and so I applied it. Um, to, to my domain more recently. Um, but if you're interested in this idea, because we had a great motivation in the beginning of learning the level of non-stationarity, there's a nice uh, survey paper that has these and other algorithms. Okay. Um, but in the context that we were trying to do, which is do better than the red curve um, at uh, predicting these temperature anomalies, um, this worked well. We had a lot of different experiments on historical data. Um, where it worked well. How do you do a future simulation? Um, so we don't have labels in the future. Uh, and so we had a climate science collaborator that, that said let's use something called the 
I think it's called the true model or the perfect model assumption in the climate literature, where you just clamp one of the models. Let's pretend the NASA model is the truth. So it'll just be used as the label sequence. It won't, it'll be removed from the ensemble of, of experts for training um, and see how well we can predict that and then just do this repeatedly with a variety of different holdouts. So with respect to that fake labeling sequence, there was another model, the one in green, that did pretty well at minimizing loss, so here up is bad. Um, and the learning algorithm can do as well, or sometimes even better, than the best expert whose identity can't be known in hindsight. Okay, so that's the temporal story, and we want to go to the spatiotemporal story um, and model spatial influence. And th this is where I want to sort of pop out and say that this is something that really came from applications, but is, is open, certainly in terms of the theory. So John talked at the beginning about how um, contextual bandits don't have theory in the non-stationary case. The online learning algorithms that I talk about uh, do have theory in the non-stationary case, um, and right now we are actually trying to work out the online plus spatial theory. We have the algorithms, but we're trying to back that with theory, but this was largely open in machine learning. Um, okay, so one thing you could do, maybe let's just um, run the algorithm at a bunch of different places simultaneously, but how do we exploit sort of uh, local structure? And this picture, by the way, is terrible local structure. This is saying, oh, I'm related to my neighbors to the north, south, east, west. Really, there are techniques where you can learn geographical relationships. So for example, in South America over the Andes, there's not a lot of um, connections or correlations on one or the other side of that range of mountains. Um, but someone will give us a neighborhood scheme. And then with respect to a neighborhood scheme, we can change the algorithm to, um, to propagate neighborhood influence. Essentially now we're just changing that transition dynamics that I talked about before in the hidden Markov chain. Um, and we can, we can turn it off. We can turn off the geospatial influence beta and get back to um, the update that we had before. But to the extent that we turn it on, we look in our neighborhood set of a particular region and we, we check how a particular climate model is doing with respect to the, algorithm, the weight that the algorithm gave it in the neighboring region. Um, and we'll use that to potentially increase our probability of switching to that expert. So what, what do I mean here? Maybe in, um, in Paris, the NASA model was um, predicting really well um, and if we're also trying to model Saclay, which is outside of Paris, we might want to put more weight on the NASA model because it's a nearby region and we know that the NASA model was performing well in Paris. Okay, so this is what I'm calling a distributed online learning approach, distributed sp spatially. Um, you could also take the fact that, well, to derive those online learning algorithms, we appealed to um, Bayesian updates of a hidden Markov model and say, well, we should be able to get to a hidden Markov random field over the whole globe, right? So we had a hidden Markov model over time. Now we could just extend these over space, have a lattice over space, and also model non-stationarity over space. So, now we have this lattice, um, we have parameters governing um, or, or fitting parameters or learning them online for non-stationarity with respect to time and non-stationarity with respect to space. So maybe um, the UK model is better in one location than in another location, for example. I just want to say this approach is not lightweight and distributed. This is highly complex, right? We've got this hidden Markov random field that's evolving over time. So at each time we get a whole new layer of the grid and then we're going to have to recompute the marginals everywhere. Um, but we did an uh, implementation of this at, um, at certain resolutions. Um, using Gibbs sampling so that we could compare all the methods. Um, so the method that I talked about earlier in the global setting um, does, does not do as well with respect to minimizing annual prediction loss as the spatially explicit techniques. And this is just for a global experiment. Um, <clears throat> that curve will go away when we consider a regional exper uh, experiment because it's not a regional method. Um, and there we see, so this is regional losses now averaged globally. Um, 
we'll see that just making things spatially explicit gets some improvement. The most improvement is from the Markov random field approach. But given the high computational overhead, we view sort of our lightweight distributed online learning algorithm as a better idea, and that's the flavor that we're trying to now analyze theoretically. Okay. Um, so in modeling spatial influence, we were exploiting spatial neighborhoods. I want to take the same idea and think about exploiting um, neighborhoods in time. And this is again where I want to pop out and say, from applications, we talked about a problem that we think is also interesting um, and has not been very well studied <coughs> in machine learning. So in climate, we had data of the form, or uh, climate predictions of the form where each model, so the NASA model, the UK model, the French model, et cetera, has to make a prediction um, one month in advance, but also two months, three months, four months. So it has to output an ensemble of 11 or 12 predictions at every time. So in January, I have to predict February um, through um, December. Um, so 11 different predictions, but in February, I again output 11 different predict predictions. Um, so the idea was, um, this, is, this means that we're solving a bunch of tasks simultaneously. Um, how could we apply multitask learning so that our prediction at any of the, um, of the, of the desired time frames um, is, is more skillful than treating them indep independently. Um, so here we, um, we extended from a, a online um, a multitask online learning approach. You do have to specify your task similarity matrix, so I would say it's future work to maybe learn this. Um, and for now, we were just assuming some locality and time. So we're basically saying, <clears throat> if the French model is good at predicting in April, from January, then let's also assume that it's relatively good at predicting March and May. So you have locality in time uh, monthly. And there's going to be some, some parameter of how much um, temporal influence you include between tasks. And now you can sort of forget about what we said about learning the level of non-stationarity. Here, we're just going to use standard hedge, but then modify it to look at the similarity matrix between tasks to get the multitask version. And we varied the parameter s, and now um, down is good, because we're looking at um, improvements against standard hedge. And for all of the um, forecast periods, so this is predicting at two weeks, 1.5 months, 2.5 months, et cetera, we get improvement for some s. And only on two of the tasks do we eventually get degradation after some value of the parameter. Um, for the short task, that can be explained by the fact that um, if you're doing the two-week task, you have had the freshest data the last time you updated, so the, the other tasks aren't going to help you that much. And we also did a variant of this to predict um, the, the volatility of the Dow um, from, um, from implied volatility on the individual stocks at a lag, okay? Wow, okay, I was so much faster than I thought. Awesome, because I wanted to discuss some, um, some recent work. Um, this is an ongoing project here in Paris um, with my postdoc, Sophie giffard Razin, and we have an M2 intern, Mo Young, and we're collaborating with um, uh, Guillaume Charpiat at LRI. Um, and so, there was interest, um, sort of, let's see. Wait, how much time do I have? Oh, OK. There's some deleted slides that maybe I can Im include. But um, so you, you had all these things where um, you know Puerto Rico was hit um, twice, and it didn't know to prepare. What, or was it Cuba? There were, there were a lot of different, um, very unpredictable um, storm tracks. And can we use machine learning in this setting? Um, and so we are going to have storm track data. And maybe we can also consider fields, field data that we have, like wind field, temperature field, pressure fields, et cetera. 
Um, so can we predict tracks and intensifications? And um, is, is deep learning an effective approach here? And so first I wanted to mention, um, with respect to machine learning or computer vision, um, there are actually papers on tracking deformable objects. But typically that means like a person or an animal or a soccer ball that will just deform a little bit, but not just you know, some kind of trace of, of fluid and sort of more of a flu fluid dynamic setting. Actually, if people know about machine learning algorithms for this setting, please let me know. Um, and then on the climate side, there's essentially, um, I would call nearest neighbor techniques, this idea of method of analogs. Let's just store data on all past storms and then given a new storm, let's see which one it looks like the most in, in whatever setting we're looking at. Um, and there's starting to be um, some machine learning approaches. There was an approach um, that got a, a lot of attention, but it wasn't looking at um, time at all. So also a plug for Tuesday's hackathon. We have all these storm tracks. Um, so it's measurements of location. There's a few other things like wind speed that are measured um, every six hours on storms since 1979, tropical depression or above. So it goes tropical depression, tropical storm. And these are the categories of extreme storms. And it's either a hurricane or a cyclone or a typhoon, depending on where you live. That's just language. Okay. So what we have results for now is um, a deep learning model where we wanted to take into account image data. That's what deep learning is good for. So you can get images by looking at the field of some variable. So we're looking at the field of U and V wind speed, so a field for each. And we're looking at, at three level sets of pressure. And, um, for now, we're just looking at it at the current time and the previous time, which is six hours ago. Um, and for that, we're able to do convolutions, right, because we have image data. Um, we're using ReLU and um, uh, batch norm, and then we're doing some fully connected layers at the end to predict just an xy coordinate for the next location of the center of the storm. So what's really great about this data is that we're getting where the storm center is by some domain experts that you know can determine that. Um, and so we just want to predict the x, y for the next center. Um, so this is not from the storm track data. This is data that we created by centering boxes around the x, y position of the center. Then we can also use track data. And th these are not images. So we just do fully a fully connected neural network here and um, train them each. First, we train these each independently to predict the x, y coordinate of where's the storm going to be six hours from now. Um, and then we combine them um, and do some fully connected layers to get down to a final forecast. Um, and I mean, these are very sort of like trial and error uh, deep learning things, and this is my, the first time that we've presented it. Um, but I will say that these, the pre-training is really important, but neither of these networks worked the best independently. Um, so you can drill down and look at some of the predicted tracks. So here's an actual storm track in black. The baseline is just saying that the, the displacement from the next six hours will be um, the same like in the same direction and um, will end up as the displacement from the previous six hours. And that's actually one of the features that's input to the whole neural network. So we have the baseline is one of our features. So, some, so often our prediction is, is better than that. So um, the, the, the baseline might be saying, OK, continue on this trajectory. But we've obviously learned something that could lead to a change. So these ones are pretty good. Um, they're, you know, as you can see, this is just saying add a vector of the same um, direction to the previous time. That's the baseline, but the prediction is doing something a little bit more interesting. Um, and you know, some of these storm tracks are relatively difficult. The prediction is still doing okay. It can also get messed up though. So here, 
The red did better at sort of following this sudden curve, um, but then when the storm actually did straighten out, our deep learning is telling it to go off somewhere else, whereas just predicting the previous displacement would have been okay. Um, so in terms of cumulative results, here's how the test errors compare of um, the baseline, which is just using um, the previous displacement. So we don't have plots yet comparing to any other methods um, other than just using the previous displacement. Um, and so none of the individual networks could do as well as the fused network. Um, this is test error. And then when we restrict to, although we train on the whole data um, in our, uh, which is obviously different from our test set, in the test set, we only test on those with wind speed greater than um, 64 knots, so those that classify as hurricanes, because this compares to the weather, weather literature, then this is the result, it's, it's similar. Okay, um, so quick take home messages. Um, tried to get you interested in climate informatics. Um, talked about learning the level of non-stationarity in both time and space, and exploiting local structure in space and time although there's open questions. Um, and these are some of the open, or some of the new questions from machine learning that our research addressed, um, but were completely spurred by um, applications. And so for, anyway, so if people are interested in the hackathon, um, please see me after and I'll get you hooked up with that. And here's information on the climate informatics community. So any, uh, is there any question for uh, Claire? Yep. Going back. Uh, so thank you for, for your talk. Um, in terms of the, 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 in the ensemble method that you talk about, is there a reason why you are using a, a lattice model for the spatial part or um, is there a reason why you're not using a more uh, continuous uh, spatial model for that? Um, I think we would probably get better results by learning that, that field. And a random Banerjee's group has done that. So I mentioned, um, so they did it in South America, for example, and found that there were no edges over the Andes. So you could start by learning your graphical model spatially and then um, and then do your, your updates from that. That's a combination of um, sort of our work and their work that I think would be interesting to do. I was just wondering to what extent the, the climate di dynamics is taken into account by the domain expert models. So how much of the, let's say, how much historical data the, it's... Oh, I love this question. <laughs> okay, so um, the first time I put this plot of the data, which is towards the beginning, up, it was at uh, Snowbird. And Jan LeCun had invited me, and he, but he was in the back of the room, and he stood up and said, it looks like they're fitting to the past data, right? We get this big fan out. So first, yes. So first, um, one caveat. When I mentioned computing anomalies where you take an average from a benchmark period and subtract it from each time series per location, the benchmark period is actually in this region, and that's why you get values close to zero here and you generally get a tightening if that's where you take your anomalies. Um, but yes, what has happened, at least from anecdotal evidence that I can understand, is that if there was some kind of competition and a model didn't perform well, um, those modelers would say, oh, you know, why don't we simulate some more aerosols or something? So there's no direct, as we view it, tuning there's no data-driven tuning. So they're not using input data um, to change their predictions here, using ob observed data. But there's, it, it's basically 
hand done. If, um, if a model is consistently performing badly, they might say, oh, we need to improve, um, we, we need to change one of the parts um, of the model that our results are sensitive to. I mentioned aerosols because actually the results are usually quite sensitive to that and it's very hard to monitor. Um, so yes, that, that has certainly happened. Luckily, in terms of the theory, um, the, their regret bounds, so relative performance guarantees, and they hold um, even if experts or predictors are, com are completely correlated. Another even bigger correlation, though, is what is a model? It's all these different components. Well, the sea ice component that is implemented in one country is used in several countries for sea ice. So, and there's a, there was a software engineer that did a study on the code base overlaps. So, the, um, so some of the models overlap in that way as well. Uh, thanks for the talk. I, I have a, one concern, actually. Uh, we've talked about uh, causality today a lot. Um, I mean, from my point of view, there's why, why don't you consider causality to study interactions between models in this exact uh, setting? I mean, there's uh, meteorological models eventually, which leads to a geological model. So why, why don't we consider causality? Have you considered? So actually, there's a big climate informatics group considering causality. I would refer you to Imi Ebert Uphoff at Colorado State. So they did this beautiful work. They were looking at various variables having to do with circulation in the northern hemisphere. Um, and they would learn a Bayes net and it was actually, I thought, sort of an interesting use of Bayes nets because usually you're trying to use them generatively or for classification, et cetera, or predictively. They were learning from the learned structure. So she learned this Bayes net at, at different times, deleted edges that she could disprove as not being causal. Of course, you can never prove an edge as causal. Looked at the persistent edges, and they had a finding that storm tracks are moving north in the northern hemisphere with climate change. Now, this is known in the meteorological um, literature, but it was a fully sort of uh, causal uh, Bayesian approach. Um, it's just not what my group has worked. I was working on um, these lightweight online learning algorithms and regret bounds. I'm coming more from a community of John, but yeah, causality is really important. And I've, I think um, we've, we've had um, various speakers from exactly that field, so I would, highly encourage you to look at the work of Ime Ebert Upoff. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have this uh, very weird question about models. Uh, you just hinted on this uh, uh, just a little bit earlier. Um, how, how much uh, um, change of parameters is there going on in each of these models that you do not see eventually, that you're essentially uh, trying to fit to, or I mean, you're trying to apply your methods to, but ah. how do you um, uh, have trust on any of these models that have essentially changed over time? Okay, so there's two ways your question could be interpreted, so I'll answer both ways. In a single run, so if we look just at this purple curve that comes from, say, Britain, the parameters don't change. They're fixed in all the differential equations. Okay, but you made it make a very good point. Well, I'll, I'll say two things. One is on, ensembles of models from different countries is one way that models are studied, uh, that ensembles are studied, but actually a lot of what they're doing is saying, you know, in the UK with our model, let's take one parameter, say something to do with ice melting or something, and let's vary that slightly, and now we get an ensemble of simulations from that. So they're interested in studying ensembles that way. They're also saying even fixing the parameters, if we change initial conditions slightly, now initial conditions actually are sometimes based on, on data observations. We get drastically different changes. Um, and then you can throw machine learning at it to do all sorts of things with those ensembles. Of course, we as the data miners don't really care how the data was generated. Um, but it's, it's frustrating and they have a field on uncertainty quantification. You can, you can quantify uncertainty with respect to the distribution that you perturbed, whatever you perturbed, and you can get nice schedules for exploring the parameter space that you're exploring, but it becomes existential or philosophical 
how to draw the boundaries of the space that you're exploring. And this we've seen this in finance. Um, that's, yeah, it'd be fun to sort of chat about, but there's not much more we can kind of say about that. Well, I'm sorry to ask yeah. a second question then. How, how do you feel like uh, researchers, say in Britain, for instance, are interested in that particular parameter, uh, essentially change their point of view with regard to whether or not they should be studying this more or not, based on the fact that essentially the model has been doing well or they have been all doing all these computations. My question comes down to um, uh, research-wise, uh, people that are on the meteorology side of things end up trying to spend most of their lives on very specific parameters, and they are essentially putting their input into those models. Um, you seem to be saying that uh, eventually you, uh, we cannot care about this. What's the? How, how oh no, no, no! I'm I'm acknowledging it as a problem. I think what is new is to come in with more tools than they had been using before for data analytics, and to also come in with using observed data in addition to the physics-based models. But I've had modelers, I've given talks about this to climate scientists, and I've had modelers say, you know, we're working on the next generation of climate models, all this funding is going into it. What if you put the new generation climate models and the old generation climate models all together in an ensemble and see which ones are, you know, get more weight, et cetera, um, which, you know, I didn't think I was gonna get a paper out of it that in machine learning, but there's a lot of sort of interesting issues there with, um, I've been actually arguing that, I mean, I definitely want the modeling effort to continue and to continue to be funded and it's important to argue for that, especially in my country right now. Um, but I, I sort of build data analytics as almost the cheapest way to unlock insights from all this data, observed and modeled, that we have that hasn't really fully been exploited. Thank you. Thanks again.